views expressed on this program are those of the hosts, guests, and callers, and are not necessarily those of this station, its management, or other advertisers. You're listening to Transformation Talk Radio. This show's audio was via a Skype call. Get fired up for Spirit Fire Radio with your hosts, Dorothy Riddle and Steve Kramer. Get ready to shine the light on universal spiritual principles and uncover ways that ageless wisdom can guide you in cultivating consciousness in these modern times. Bring purpose to your life through practical spirituality and add to your awareness with Spirit Fire Radio. Now, here are your hosts, Dorothy Riddle and Steve Kramer. Hello, listeners. Welcome to Spirit Fire Radio. My name is Steve Kramer, and I am joined by my co-host, Dr. Dorothy Riddle. Hello, Dorothy. Hi, Steve. Great to be here. Great to be with you as well. And listeners, great to be with you. Thanks for joining us. We are on the fourth week of nonlinearity. We are talking about the universal principle of nonlinearity. And this week, we're going to talk about social change. Nonlinearity and change are both universal principles, change for sure. But does social change follow these nonlinear patterns as well? So we talked a bit about this last week. Uh, last week we were talking about maturity. And I, when we think of social change, we think that, that, well, we are maturing in our sense of responsibility towards each other, uh, that we are learning to be more harmless toward each other. So uh, we're going to begin with that. But first, Dorothy, a uh, few quotes I hear you've got in store yes. for us today. <laughs> I'd love to. Uh, there's, there are three that I would like to share. Uh, the first is from Barack Obama. Uh, he said, change will not come if we wait for some other person or if we wait for some other time. We are the ones we've been waiting for. We are the change that we seek. And uh, Margaret Mead uh, said, I think this is a very well-known quote, never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens can change the world. Indeed, it is the only thing that ever has. And then finally, Gandhi's uh, quote, be the change that you wish to see in the world. So to me, Steve, this is, you know, it's very much, uh, you know, we are the ones that need to do it. And if we think of development in a linear fashion, then we can just assume this kind of cause and effect that, you know, well, this is going to happen. Uh, We have no control over it. There's nothing that we can do about it. It's kind of a deterministic view, as opposed to assuming personal responsibility and saying, no, actually what's going on right now doesn't need to continue to happen. And this I'd just like to link it back to discussions that some of our listeners may have missed about uh, the science that tells us that we are in a probabilistic universe, not a deterministic universe. Well, there, there's so much in the quotes that speak of potential and that we are that potential. And we've talked uh, quite a bit about that in terms of quantum science, right? Potentiality. And mm-hmm. so it's all very freeing. You know, it all feels like just, you know, feel into your own heart <laughs> and and be that to to create that in your own life and that we all have got that potential. It's all those quotes are, are very inspiring indeed. Thank you for those. Yeah. And so I'd like to you know, we talked about uh, maturing in terms of of a connection to the common good as opposed to just our own individual needs. And that's part of what harmlessness is about. I, I just would like to link this, con- the conversation of social change to harmlessness. Uh, we can have violent change that is actually very harmful to a lot of people, or we can choose uh, to approach social change from the perspective of trying to broaden inclusivity, trying to make sure that people all have the rights to which they're entitled. 
that they are all treated with respect and dignity as we as is put forth in the UN's Universal Declaration of Human Rights. And that, I think, is what we want to focus on this week, is that image of social change, which is then grounded in learning to live together in a harmless fashion. Mm. Yes, indeed. I come back to this feeling of, personally, of, of sensing what it feels like to be connected to another, like where does that land in my body? And it usually lands, you know, it lands somewhere in my heart, of course, because that, uh, that to me is this sort of energy center of interconnectedness. And it's this idea of we, when we talk about harm, Dorothy, we'll often talk about that world, that word, um, separateness, that, that, Mm -hmm that is where we run into problems as soon as we see the other, you know, as soon as we see ourselves separate. It's like if we, if we think about um, just the word uh, connection or, or the feeling of being grateful uh, or when we feel generous, when we feel like giving to another, when you just feel into those words or imagine a time when you sense that, you, you can sense this expansion and that expansion then is allowing of others. But, uh, you know, if, if, if we think of times in which we feel separated, like fearful or we're defensive or we're anxious or worried, then it feels like it's contracted. And so it's again, uh, when we, when we're worried, it's often about the future. When we regret, it's about the past. So you can sense that when we're in contraction, we almost fall into that linearity. We almost, we become sort of contracted and separated from each other. But when we feel that expansion, when we are considering the other, we, we sense that automatically we open up, we create space. Uh, I just wanted to mention uh, this. I read of this interesting experiment that was uh, designed to generate this sense of awe. And I would, I would use, you know, we mentioned curiosity last week, a sense of wonder and awe that these are expansive emotions or expansive experiences. And there's a researcher, his uh, name is Dasher Keltner, and he's at Berkeley. And he did these interesting experiments to prove that awe elicits a sense of interconnectedness. So he took volunteers and asked them to spend a minute either in front of this beautiful grove of eucalypt, eucalyptus trees, staring at these trees, or staring at a building facade for one minute. And then bystander passes by and sort of trips and scatters these pens on the ground. The bystanders who had been looking at the trees proved more likely to come to the aid of this person than the people who looked at a building. So they were generating this sense. These trees were magnificent, this sense of awe. And we talked last week about nature. And he did another experiment where he was asking participants to draw a self-portrait before and after looking at inspiring images of nature. So, uh, you know, the after images took up a lot less space on the paper. And so it's this, it's this way of looking at contraction and the ego and this sense of being interconnected and nature does that to us, that that elicits a sense of being interconnected, of wanting to help others, of altruism. So it can be really important in terms of maturing into our harmlessness and maturing into um, that sense of interconnectedness is paying attention to our emotions and how we're feeling and in, in what we're exposing ourselves to. Absolutely. Um, and this whole, this whole idea of how we view others, how we define others is really critical. We had, uh, you know, we've had these crises or the continuous crises going on on along the uh, southern border in particular of the United States um, with the uh, persons seeking asylum who the government uh, has been labeling publicly as illegal immigrants. It's not actually illegal to seek asylum. Um, And then the pictures of children uh, as well as adults literally in cages and uh, people who, being interviewed who say things like, well, they're not us, you know, uh, making that distinction. Um, but the result of that, you know, what we've got going on then is government-sanctioned child abuse, uh, where 
the uh, scientists and the health professionals tell us there's permanent damage being done to these children, that toxic levels of stress and cortisol in the brain disrupts the brain architecture and uh, can precipitate uh, long-term health problems. And uh, it's just, it, it just appalling that that can go on. But it can only go on if we separate and see them literally as they are not us. They are somehow another species. And it comes back to responsibility again in my eyes. You know, uh, you know, at what level? Or I, I can't imagine that people, workers can follow instructions. You know, you're talking about feeling into your heart. You know, how can you not be sort of regretful of sending, of putting a child in a cage, or or not sensing the contraction around your heart and following an order like that? I I honestly can't. Uh, I can't imagine. I personally can't imagine. Right. And we're now getting the first reports out from women of being uh, sexually abused by the government officials that are holding them in custody. Uh, not, unfortunately, not surprising, but horrifying all the same. Yes. Again, it's that defining the other as an object, as something that can be used. Yes. Amazing how we always come back to our sense of interconnectedness or lack thereof. You know, we always seem to come back to that again and again. And that was our first show. You know, interconnectedness seems to be the underlying principle of all the principles that we talk about. Right, Dorothy? Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. You know, the. um, The gentleman that I had mentioned that had done those done to go back and forth, but Hey, we're a nonlinear, right? Uh, he, he, there's a quote from him that I find, uh, I find really interesting in talking about these experiences. You know, he, he, he talks about the experience of awe, and he says that we are descendants of those who found the experience of awe blissful because it's advantageous for, for the species to have an emotion that makes us feel part of something much larger than ourselves. So, you know, this larger entity that's larger than ourselves could be group awareness, for instance, like I'm a part of the human race. You know, I I can't subject other human beings to this experience or to be in nature as he was talking about, you know, um, this idea of of an awareness of nature and how that makes us feel a part of something. Um, But he says that it's essential that we experience this sense of awe that, that, and he says to quote, it's something sufficiently overpowering that dwarfs us and our narrow self interest, that it gives us a sense of the small selves and it directs our attention away from the individual to the group and the greater good. So this experience, we've got to elicit this experience of seeing the big picture of seeing ourselves as a one life, you know, as a human family, it's just so essential in terms of social change for sure. So Dorothy, we're at our first break. Uh, listeners will be back just after these messages. Stay juicy. Tune in to Your Juicy Love with me, Una Drake, co-hosting monthly with Dr. Pat and every second Monday at 12 p.m. on Transformation Talk Radio. My show, Your Juicy Love, helps you find the dynamic, life-affirming love you've always wanted. Transform your relationships and bring peace, joy, and juicy, juicy love to planet Earth. For more information, visit unadrake.com. Conscious Confidence Radio, a timeless wisdom with Sarah Main. Tune in each month on Transformation Talk Radio and join Sarah on an adventurous journey to the deeper level of meaning to move beyond today's world of constant change, confusion, and uncertainty beyond the shadow of fear. This hit show explores key concepts such as confidence, values, and attitude in a dynamic way. To learn more about Sarah and her work, visit sarahmain.com. Are you looking to grow spiritually, expand your consciousness, 
increase psychic abilities? Well, there's a free app for that. Pure Light offers audios that transmit high spiritual frequencies to help you awaken to your full potential. Hundreds of audios created by some of the world's top energy healers, and many are free. Enjoy the latest in conscious technology and download Pure Light today. To find out more, visit purelightaudio.com. Hi, I'm Barbara Scheidegger, clinical hypnotherapist and founder of Swiss Hypnotherapy. And this is a tip with purpose. Be willing to make a change for the good. If you want to know what your thoughts were like in the past, look at your body today. If you want to know what your body will be like in the future, look at your thoughts today. This was Deepak Chopra who said that. And it's true. But it's never, ever too late to make a change. And many things can be reversed. If you put your mind into it and make an effort, now you can make the change and tomorrow you will feel much better. Start now and look forward. Past is the past. There is no future in it. But in the now, you can find the future for tomorrow. I hope this tip helps you. You can reach me at swisshypnotherapy.com. Welcome back, listeners, to Spirit Fire Radio. Before the break, we were talking about awe, this sense of awe. And Dorothy, you know, I've mentioned so many times uh, astronauts and the experience that I love hearing astronauts' experience of seeing the Earth. And they always mention this sense of wonder and curiosity as they see the Earth and the moon in this sort of the infinite nature of space. We all, you know, certainly... um, there are so few of us who will ever experience that perspective, but they all talk about seeing the earth as this living organism in which they are a part of. And so it's this idea of seeing ourselves as a part of this living nonlinear, right? This living, organic, constantly evolving vessel. And that's not so easy for so many of us. I mean, I would say that meditation is a wonderful uh, way in which to do that, to become the observer, to see oneself in a way. It's that to see ourselves as a vessel in which we inhabit, and that can generate a sense of curiosity and wonder and awe. But yeah, that's not so easy for all of us, huh? I mean, that that in that, just like uh, being an astronaut, we all don't get that experience of lifting off the Earth. We don't don't get that experience of seeing the greater whole. It can be challenging. Well, I'd like to just uh, qualify that a bit because you can have that that experience of awe, that sense of being part of a greater whole, and you can still put boundaries on what that whole is, mm. because you can have that you can have a sense even of the Earth as a living entity, it doesn't necessarily mean that that astronaut or that person is going to uh, push the boundary out then to include non-human persons and to recognize that we, there, we not only share the Earth with the Earth, but we share it with many other species that have been proven by science to be intelligent, to be very social, uh, to be self-aware, uh, and we tend to think of humans as being the only ones that really share those those qualities. So that's just one example of how we can have a sense of awe, we can have a sense of connection, but it doesn't necessarily uh, carry us on to the broadest possible sense of the one life. Right. Well, I mean, may it be so that that is our maturing, that that is the result of maturing and striving. Uh, to sort of disintegrate these boundaries of, you know, that, that keep us in separateness, right? I mean, that's... That's, that's right. And, and one of the ways that we, that we uh, reinforce that separateness is by defining things by comparison. It's like, it's not enough to just appreciate something or someone by itself, but it, we tend to describe it as better than or worse than something else. Um, we tend to talk about 
uh, something that is newer as being better than what went before. Um, and all of th- these are, are some of the presuppositions that affect how we would approach the whole process of social change. Right. It's this also this idea of that, you know, is social change actually, mm-hmm. no, is it nonlinear in terms of time? I mean, we, we sort of assume that things, as we talked about last week with people, that we assume that somebody who is 70 is going to be more mature than somebody who is 30. And it's not always the case, as we were mentioning Trump and Trudeau. Uh, it's the same thing with social changes. They seem to be nonlinear. You know, we make great strides forward and then we seem to take a few steps back. We've made wonderful strides. Uh, indeed, but it does seem to be as well this organic process uh, of us all, you, you know, it, 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 it takes two steps forward and one step back sometimes. Yeah, sometimes. and that's something that, that uh, requires patience. You know, I, for myself, when I used to do workshops on, on change, uh, one of the things that we would talk about is that oftentimes We go through a process where we try something new, we adopt something new, and then we slip into what we used to do. And oftentimes that happens three times, maybe more, but three times, that's my experience, until the the new way of behaving is really locked in. Um, And so it's a matter of, of having patience with that process. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, when you were saying that newer is better, it made me think of, of that in that, well, newer just is, and (laughs) it may be revealed, you know, time will reveal if newer is actually better. Uh, indeed. And I think of, it may not be better. Yeah. 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 Well, I think of, um, I think of, for instance, gay marriage, you know, that, that, it appeared in terms of social change to be this, uh, you know, wonderful move forward. But we saw quite a response and, and quite a bit of backlash, you know, from that. Uh, I, I think of, um, you know, for instance, Kennedy, uh, you know, the justice, his quote was that that uh, he says, and I quote, their hope is not to be condemned to live in loneliness, excluded from one of civilization's oldest institutions, meaning marriage. But then, and then he said, they ask for equal dignity in the eyes of the law. The constitution grants them that right. And then I think of the Supreme court then that sided with the baker who refused to bake a wedding cake uh, for a gay couple's marriage due to his religious beliefs. And it sort of goes back to your, that, you know, people could have a sense of awe and a sense of, you know, of, uh, of feeling a sense of beauty in the world that could be related to their uh, religion, but yet at the same time discriminate, you know, and Mm -hmm. the court granted, the court said that that this decision was very limited to the specifics of this case and that it didn't grant the right to discriminate, although it sounds very discriminatory to me, you know, that business owners can't deny equal access to goods and services, although it really seems that that happens. So, you know, it's this whole idea that we all have our own interpretation of, of what it is to be a human being in a, in a culture and what does it mean to, to be interrelated. And some of our versions are, 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 are all of our versions are different uh, from one another. Well, they're different, but getting, if we bring this back to the social change process, uh, Part one of the prerequisites to engage in, in positive social change is to recognize the presuppositions that that we're working from. And we've mentioned some of them, um, but there's some others like a kind of an all or nothing approach. You know, well, if we can't get it all changed, there's no no point in starting um, and then opting out. I I think of a of a good friend of mine who kind of keeps his finger on the pulse of what's happening politically and is you know, pretty politically literate, if you want to put it that way. And he was saying that an increasing number of his friends were opting out. They didn't like what, what was happening, but they didn't see it as either their responsibility or their ability to make any change. And that reminds me of another quote, which is... Uh, if I'm saying it correctly, 
uh, all that evil needs to thrive is for good people to do nothing. Yeah. And what was interesting to me was that he mentioned that, and I appreciated that he mentioned that, but he didn't see himself as needing to take any action to engage them in discussions about what they might do, what small pieces they could uh, affect. Mm, like seeing his potential, right, in, in right. inspiring them and engaging them. Yeah, yeah. It, we've mm. got to stay curious. That seems to be a seems to be a wonderful word. Uh, is is staying curious? Is looking around? Right. Mm -hmm. Well, it's yeah. curiosity. And then I think we are only scratching the surface of understanding what it means to live in a probabilistic universe, uh, because what it says is a particular outcome may be very, very, very unlikely, but it is not zero percent, right? That there are many possible outcomes. And we've seen you know, in the U.S. political system, we've seen uh, several different examples of the unlikely outcome uh, being the one that manifested. And so we have the ability to precipitate that. We have the ability to say, I see a different vision, and there are others that share that with me, and so let's move towards that. What are the steps that we can take to include more and more people and uh, flesh out what that vision is so that it really w works for as many of us as possible. Dorothy, we are at a break and listeners, we will be right back after these words. Did you know that all of the shows on the Transformation Radio Network are available as podcasts to stream or download? Really? Check us out. Go to TransformationRadio.fm. We have business shows, spiritual shows, energy healing shows, and pretty much everything in between. Something for everyone guaranteed to inspire, educate, and transform. We are transforming the world one listener at a time. Living Lighter Radio with Jason and Patricia. We have an ecosystem approach to your life. Tune in weekly every Monday at 1 p.m. Pacific on Transformation Talk Radio as we, Jason and Patricia, discuss what's truly holding you back. We offer you the tools you need to reach your goals and at the same time be living lighter. For more information about Living Lighter, visit www.livinglighter.org. To find answers to life's questions, you need to look within yourself. Dr. Glenna Rice brings your questionable conversations on Transformation Talk Radio each month. Tune in each month for insight into how you can live up to your full potential. Dr. Glenna is a physical therapist, certified access consciousness, and access body class facilitator. How does it get any better than this? For more information on Dr. Glenna Rice and her work, visit GlennaRice.com. Love Living Radio Ignite Your Whole Being with Emily Perkins is a show for those looking to explore the sparkling magnificence of their inner selves. Tune in every second and fourth Wednesday at 4 p.m. Pacific as Emily sheds a radiant light of love on the beauty and power that resides within you. Discussing love in all its forms through conversations that provoke awareness, curiosity, and expansion, Emily shares the unlimited power of love. For more information or to listen to this show, visit lovelivingholistics.com. Dream on, fly high, and live adventurously on The Laura Meeks Show. Tune in each month on Transformation Talk Radio as host Laura Meeks guides you in finding your unique gifts and bringing them to life. As a certified life coach, speaker, and veteran bomber pilot for the U.S. Air Force, Laura knows how to follow a dream. She is ready to support you so you can dream on, fly high, and live adventurously. For more information on Laura and her work, visit flyhighliving.com. Wow. Hey, everyone. Welcome. Uh, welcome to the Dr. Pat Show. This is Talk Radio to Thrive By. I'm telling you, I got to pinch myself some days because when each of us gets called... 
to do something that we so not thought was in our wheelhouse to do for a purpose that's so much greater than us, we get to show up and shine. If you would like to show up and shine on The Dr. Pat Show as a co-host or sponsor, send us an email to inspire at thedrpatshow.com. Welcome back, listeners, to Spirit Fire Radio. Dorothy and I love to take a moment to tell you about our organizations. This is a collaboration between this being Spirit Fire Radio is a collaboration between Spirit Fire and the School for Esoteric Studies. Dorothy, would you like to take a moment to tell our listeners about your organization? Absolutely. So I'm with the School for Esoteric Studies. You can find out more about us at esotericstudies.net. We are an educational nonprofit uh, focused on providing spiritual training uh, for persons who have a spiritual practice that they want to deepen. And we do this through meditation, study, and service. And we also have a number of group initiatives uh, that we engage in. And one of the initiatives that we chose to launch a couple of years ago was to reach out to other organizations for purposeful uh, inter-organizational collaboration. So instead of just working on our own and working uh, with our students, that we would work with other like-minded organizations. And I'm absolutely thrilled that Spirit Fire is one of those organizations, and this is one of those collaborations. I just want to mention that if you are listening and you are with an organization that might like to also uh, collaborate with us, please look on the website at esotericstudies.net and you'll see a section there on collaboration. Wonderful, uh, beautiful website, uh, the School for Esoteric Studies with just lots of wonderful information. And speaking of website Spirit Fire, you can find out more about us at spiritfire.com. We are an educational nonprofit as well, uh, focusing on meditation, study, and service. We have our own meditation practice called the Practice of Living Awareness. It's an online meditation practice. It's free, and uh, we've always got new meditations online. So uh, check us out at spiritfire.com. We've also got Spirit Fire Retreat Center, which supports those meditations uh, through meditation retreats and online classes and always trying to make spirituality practical, which is really a goal for this show between uh, uh, Dorothy and I always try to bring that to the forefront ways to sort of take it out into your lives, these concepts, these universal principles. So Dorothy, back to uh, nonlinearity, social change, the word flexibility keeps uh, coming up and even with collaboration, right? And with being co-creative interconnectedness, it, we have, we, it, it allows us to be flexible. Once we start creating with somebody, as we co-create, we find that, that it is required to be flexible. It's good to exercise that flexibility is, is so important, uh, to being creative and to relating to another. There's a wonderful, uh, sort of picture painted by a neuroscientist. His name is uh, Mendel Kaleen, and he's talking about the brain and a bit about flexibility, being open to the new. He says, to think of the brain as a hill covered in snow and thoughts as sleds gliding down that hill. As one sled after another goes down the hill, a small number of main trails will appear in the snow. And every time a new sled goes down, that's the thoughts, it will be drawn into the pre-existing trails almost like a magnet. In time, it becomes more and more difficult to glide down the hill on any other path or in a different direction. I find that to be such a beautiful way of looking at the brain and even at the way of sometimes we fall into line of, well, 
you know, this is just the way it is, right, Dorothy, in terms of social change, of not being the change we want to see. We as as human beings, we just fall into the ridge and we go with it without being able to step out and say, you know, hey, so in, in a sense, we become more linear as as we mature. We We sort of repeat this time, space, existence, day in and day out. And we look at that as well, just getting older. We become fixed in a way and rigid and we can't allow for our um, culture and our society to become that way because we've got to evolve. We've got to change. We've got to constantly approve on, improve upon it, right? Well, I don't know that I would say we constantly have to improve on it, but we have to constantly be aware of what it is that we're reinforcing that for sure. Uh, because the yeah. neuroplasticity of the brain, you know, carries with it both the the joy that we can make change and also the caution, which you just described, which is that if we allow ourselves to habituate in a particular way of thinking or a particular way of behaving, that becomes the way in which we will act, particularly if we're in a situation where we need to react quickly and we can't really think it through. So we or with, have... Or, or, or Dorothy, I was just going to say, or a situation that requires a different response, right? In terms of thinking of social change or even social injustice and witnessing that, you know? Well, yeah. What I was going to say was, you know, we, we have a, a, a very important stewardship role, which is to be careful of what those patterns are that we allow the, what those trails are that we allow to develop and to challenge when a trail is developing that is uh, not in the common good and to, yes. you know, to push back against that, to create right. a new trail. Right. right. Indeed. Indeed. Well, interestingly enough, you know, a, a lot of I've been reading quite a bit about these uh, neuroscientists in Michael Pollan's new book, which is called How to Change Your Mind. And it just had me thinking quite a bit about uh, the state of of the human mind. It seems like, uh, you know, depression, uh, anxiety, obsession, we see it so much more rampant in our uh, in our world today. And they talk quite a bit. A lot of these neuroscientists talk about a supple brain, you know, as you're saying, neuroplasticity, a, a flexible brain, that that's a happy brain and that anxiety, depression, and obsession. We think of a brain that's gone out of whack, but it's not. It's actually a brain where these grooves just keep repeating themselves. And what do they say? You know, that, that, uh, what's the quote Dorothy about, uh, insanity is, is doing the same thing again and again and again, and thinking that the outcome is going to be different. Well, right. it's the <laughs> idea, you know, that, that it really is mental illness. When we, we talk about mental illness so much, and it is that depression, anxiety, and obsession, it's that becoming rote, you know, of just a, allowing in a way, but also just our brain is thinking in a same loop again and again and again. And then those that seem to be on the outside that are controlling, that have positions of power that seem to be controlling the way in which we live in the world, you know, they sort of bank on the idea that so many of us are just in this mechanistic way of thinking and will just follow the leader. And that's, that's true. And when we think about, you know, creating that potential for change, in addition to flexibility, sometimes we have to remove, uh, I'm going to use the, the image again, you know, we need to remove some of those trails that have been worn down by n nurturing a grudge or nurturing a hatred or nurturing a very uh, negative stereotype. And I'd like to refer back to a discussion that we had, Steve, on forgiveness last year, which I think is very relevant right now. And for those of our listeners that didn't, uh, that weren't with us for that segment, uh, if we think of forgiveness as being the conscious, deliberate process of releasing negative feelings and recognizing that we do it for ourselves because as long as we are holding on, we've got this deeply ingrained, iced-in trail that is going to prevent us from taking different kinds of action or seeing a different perspective. So we don't have to necessarily uh, reconcile 
We don't necessarily have to um, say everything's fine, uh, let bygones be, be bygones. But what we do need to recognize is that the negative feelings are holding us captive. They're, they're creating this uh, knot of energy that keeps us from, from having the ability to, uh, you know, to accept new possibilities, new ways of looking at things, and that there's a price to be paid if we are unwilling to release that knot. Yes, it seems like forget forgiveness uh, is so powerful, and those shows, listeners, were so wonderful uh, last year. I really enjoyed that whole series. But it seems that forgiveness sort of flattens the snow, or it lays a new, you know, cover of snow that allows us to approach ourselves and the other differently. You know, if 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 you are on the wronged side, perceived or actual side of social change. You've got to forgive in order to move forward, to embrace change, and 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 to understand that the benefit is change itself. You know, mm-hmm. it's it's not the reparations alone. So again, it becomes just not about me, uh, which is important, but also the big picture. You know, that it is it is change and 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 hopefully progress that is taking. Well, and there's a there's a technique that uh, that's been developed that I think is particularly useful. It's called appreciative inquiry, where rather than uh, making assumptions about what somebody else is thinking or believing or feeling, you ask them qu- a, a series of questions you know, to elicit how they feel, what they believe, why it's important to them. It's part of that whole uh, walking in the other person's shoes you know, to really understand what somebody else's reality is like. You may not agree with it. Uh, you may not want to adopt that as your own. But the only way that we're going to be able to work together to create uh, change for the common good is to have that sense of understanding and respect for each other. Yeah. Well, understanding as well, Dorothy, I think talking about uh, perspective and uh, flexibility and, and, and forgiveness you know, I think of, of, of the truth and the way that almost in a linear sense, but in a, in a way that, that truth gets revealed as time goes on. And that one, one thing is to, to strive that the truth may, you know, may the truth constantly be revealed so that in terms of social change, we don't recreate the past, you know, constantly allowing to, to, to look back to the past to heal so that the truth, we, we may look at it, uh, and as, as time moves on, uh, as facts arise, we, we really get to know exactly what happened. I think it's why <laughs> f- fake news is such, an, is such a favorite word of, of Donald Trump's, because, you know, it's sort of like he would like to divert uh, from the truth being revealed. So it's this idea of, of, of understanding the fullness of our experience and allowing the truth to come forward so we can have an honest, clear look of of where we were and where we might be going. And part of, of uh, that process, I think, uh, can be very humbling, you know, to recognize that we see the truth at one level and then it's another level. I think about, you know, I mean, we, we haven't solved these issues permanently, but in the United States, uh, the recognition that one could not own another person like a slave. Yes. Right, and so there was the whole anti-slavery, but people didn't ex- didn't extend that to the legal position of women for quite a while after that, um, at least 40 years uh, before women stopped being legally treated as the possessions of men, um, and then it took even longer after that to recognize that children were not possessions. Uh, They might need some stewardship, but they were persons in their own right. So we have this constantly revealed within the non-human personhood. Uh, So what we think is truth may be only partial at a particular time. And it's happening in a very organic way and touching lives in very uh, 
at, at in very different instances for different groups. But uh, may it be so that we all arrive, right, <laughs> to this notion of, of interconnectedness. Dorothy, we're at another break, and listeners will be back after these words. powerful your thoughts and beliefs are in determining your experience of your life? Is it really true that simply by changing some of the words you use in your day-to-day language that you can change your life? I'm Megan Edge. Join me on Playing on the Edge Radical Change with Ease with my co-host Dr. Pat on Transformation Talk Radio. I look forward to seeing you there. To find out more about Megan Edge, visit her website at meganedge.ca. Tune in to People Like Us Radio with Megan Lyons, transcending the trauma of the human experience. Megan will be raising the universal consciousness by empowering listeners with their own inner strength, working past trauma and abuse. Megan will show you how to find true healing and inner peace through the art and practice of self-love. Tune in every first and third Friday at 10 a.m. Pacific, 1 p.m. Eastern. For more information about Megan and her work, visit EnterTheLightLLC.com. What is a brilliant culture and how do we create them? Why are they important? Claudette Rowley has created a breakthrough five-step process to help you align your culture with your business strategy for exceptional results. Looking for a culture that drives organizational excellence? Listen to Cultural Brilliance Radio, the second and fourth Friday of each month at 10 a.m. Pacific and 1 p.m. Eastern on Transformation Talk Radio. To learn more or work with Claudette, visit culturalbrilliance.com. Would you like your next chapter to be free from fear and angst? Tune in to Your Next Chapter Radio, navigating through life's transitions with Shelley Ryan the fourth Monday at 12 p.m. Pacific on TransformationTalkRadio.com. Shelley's contagious enthusiasm guides you through life's transitions deliberately, mindfully, and funnily. For Your Next Chapter Coaching or to listen, visit YourNextChapterCoaching.com or call 602-617-8351. Next! Welcome back, listeners, to Spirit Fire Radio. We are about to wrap up the show on nonlinearity and social change. And Dorothy actually wrap up the entire month on uh, nonlinearity. It's been very interesting. I find that nonlinearity can be uh, difficult sometimes to wrap your head around because we are experience has a tendency to be subjective. You know, we, 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 we exist in the present, but yet we look to the past to create the future. So it's interesting to talk about this uh, and sometimes challenging. And as we were talking about social change, I sort of had this insight that, that change in and of itself is always leveraging nonlinearity, that, that change is nonlinear by nature because well, each of us have a different experience of change, but that it is constantly happening everywhere, all the time, in every regard. And so there's no possible way it can be linear because it's omnipresent. It sort of exists within time as we observe it, but beyond time because the universe is quite simply just, it, it is expanding and it is, it, it is, really just up to our perception and and it is our responsibility uh in how we how we act our thoughts are magnetic and right thought leads to right speech to right action we say that all the time and so each one of us is participating and so if we've got 7 billion souls on this planet who are thinking thoughts and and taking action change is inevitable it is constantly morphing and constantly shifting. And so it just, each of us, it is each of our personal response to that 
our experience and that which we are experiencing that will bring about social change. It's going to happen regardless, positive or negative. Yeah. Uh, absolutely. Um, but, you know, I, I, one of the concepts that we talk about in relation to change is the tipping point, you know, that things will, will go along pretty much the same until there is a certain critical mass of activity that will tip things over into the new way. So that's the, that's the disjunctive part of change. And the, and the change itself can be out of proportion to that particular event. But I think what's challenging uh, when we think of it from a social change point of view is what will create that tipping point? I mean, I think uh, last week about the press conference between President Trump and President Putin and the outrage that was expressed in the moment, uh, not only in the United States, but, uh, but around the world. And uh, we even saw, we saw Republicans um, challenging uh, Trump's portrayal um, and we also saw uh, the conservative news media challenging uh, Trump's portrayal, some people even calling it treasonous. Um, and it seemed like in that moment there would be a shift. But by the next day, the comments coming out were more muted, uh, more measured, and it didn't feel at all like something was going to shift in that moment. Is that how you experienced it? Yeah, I, I will. I, I really appreciate. I really appreciate how you do this thing you do, Dorothy, <laughs> which is wonderful in bringing up the tipping point, you know, as I am sort of saying, well, you know, it's all happening everywhere all the time. And it's just really our own personal experience. And we've got to take responsibility. But there is this collective consciousness that does come together around a particular event or around a particular way in which we are uh, a direction in which we're moving, which is the tipping point, right? So yes, you know, I would agree that, uh, that it did feel like, wow, all right, something pretty big it, it just happened. And that everybody noticed, you know, <laughs> we all had a similar experience, which was this feels like a really dark moment and an actual shift of allegiances. I, uh, you know, I mean, when you really start um, <laughs> calling uh, our allies our foes, that's a pretty big deal. You know, when, when you basically say that, you know, uh, well, countries and organizations that stand up for democracy, for the voice of the people and the rule of law, th that is no longer really something that you're going to consider. That's a pretty big deal. So yes, it did seem like a, it does seem <laughs> a bit like a tipping point. Um, and these moments where we all do sort of take note and say, all right. But then again, Dorothy, it is, it comes back to how do we participate? What happens? What, you know, what, what will each of us and those in positions of power do in response? You know, will we just fall back to the the uh, channel that uh, has been made by the sled in the snow and, or is it enough to, to pop us out of those grooves? Let, let's hope so in this case. Well, yeah. And I mean, you, you said that it, it, everyone saw it that way. Not uh, President Trump didn't see it that way. He thought he had a really good news conference. So uh, right. With, or, that was one of the challenges. <laughs> King feeling folks. So let's hope, let's hope anyway. Uh, yeah. Yeah. But my experience, having been involved in a number of social change uh, movements, is real change takes time. Yeah. Uh, I mean, we're talking about nonlinear time, but it, I mean, it can feel like a very long time, although it may not be that long a time. And so it seems to me important when we talk about our responsibility in that process to figure out how we support ourselves through that process. I know part of that support for me has to come from like-minded people. You know, I, I, 
I need uh, allies. I need people who also are looking for that kind of change, that kind of, of tipping point. On the other hand, I can't isolate myself just with people that think like I do because I need to be hearing from other people. I need to be considering other perspectives. I need to be open to all of that. So, you know, how how do we remain open? How do we remain flexible, remain curious, and not get completely depressed by the fact that change isn't happening? Well, and when these events like that press conference happen, it seems that we at least connect with our common goal for just, uh, you know, some sort of uh, standard of of right and wrong, of holding people responsible for for horrible acts and that that sort of you know we would hope that just human goodness on some level at some point brings us together we would hope you know, yeah I, I sort of hope. i sort of yeah i i wonder if this just to i sometimes wonder if this whole uh, if if this whole idea of draining the swamp won't in fact I wonder if it is not if the universe is quite brilliant and actually that uh, truths will, as we've said, will be uh, revealed. I often wonder if if, you know, these instances of pure selfishness and pure irresponsibility will expose the real swamp, you know, and that it is actually in the process of being drained and that democracy and and right action is actually being reclaimed as we speak. You know, may it be so. May it be so. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Well, I think the, the another way of putting the the question um, for me is how do we how do we remain active? Uh, because I think there is a very uh, a very real um, desire sometimes to just stay in those uh, well worn trails that yes. are comfortable and familiar and not try to break a new trail, which takes a lot of effort and often uh, results in uh, having to deal with a lot of negative feedback. So how, how do we sustain ourselves through that process? How do we choose to do that, uh, to engage in that change, rather than just, staying with the comfortable and the familiar. Yeah. Well, you mentioned it in your original, in your, in the quotes at the beginning of the show to be thoughtful and to be committed, you know, and remain, you mentioned the word citizen, you know, citizens of the world of, of humanity and not just of a particular country, particular uh, group, but to see ourselves as the greater whole thoughtful and committed Mm -hmm. and to effort hope, right? It was, uh, it was the key theme of Barack Obama, maintain the hope by seeing options and, and doing your part, creating options as well. Right, Dorothy? Absolutely. So listen, we're at the end of the show. It's been very intriguing. It's been a very, very intriguing month of nonlinearity as I knew it would be as we started this, uh, this, uh, group of shows. So Dorothy, thank you so much for, again, all of your wisdom and input for the last several weeks and, uh, listeners, We look forward to being with you again soon. And we're going to be talking about non-duality. Yes. Just in case anybody thought we were moving away from a complicated topic. We're going (laughs) to dive right into another one. (laughs) Non-duality. So be with us next week. We look forward to that. I look forward to it. It'll be great. Thanks so much, Dorothy. Thanks to you. Thanks to our listeners. Bye. Thank you for listening to Spirit Fire Radio. Tune in each Wednesday at 9 a.m. Pacific, 12 noon Eastern for your weekly guide to purposeful living and practical spirituality. Join hosts Steve Kramer and Dorothy Riddle as they shine the light on universal spiritual principles and uncover ways that ageless wisdom can guide you in cultivating consciousness in your everyday life. Add to your awareness with Spirit Fire Radio. To learn more, visit spiritfireradio.com. 